Thank you, Dr. Zeger, and thank you, Dr. Bloom. Um, so thank you for the, being here uh, and being excited to share this hot off the press work with me. Um, uh, I would like to thank the Baricelli Committee for this award. It's an honor to follow in, I know, uh, Brittany's footsteps <laughs> and Lorenzo's footsteps and a, a lot of wonderful scholars at UCR. Um, and there's also two people I am going to thank um, from the Perkins School. That's Kevin Hardigan and Jennifer Arnett. These are the people who were just helping me out in the archive, sharing anecdotes, um, research tips, helping me read really difficult uh, handwriting, which you'll see in a little bit. Uh, so those people really helped me out when I was doing this most recent project, um, which comes from somewhere in the middle of my dissertation um, about alternative writing practices and their kind of really mutually constitutive relationship with literature and science in the 19th century. The name Laura Bridgman, excuse me, is largely unfamiliar today, though Bridgman was likely one of the most famous living women in America and Britain during the 1840s and 50s. She's most often discussed because her story, which is often perceived as inspirational, was published in Charles Dickens' 1842 travelogue, American Notes. Bridgman was born in 1829, and when she was two years old, barely survived a severe fever, which caused her to become both deaf and blind, and also affected her senses of smell and taste. So really, her haptic senses were the only ones fully functioning in the way that an able-bodied person would think of. Um, so she struggled to communicate in her early years, um, even with her mother or her family. But when she was seven, physician Samuel Gridley Howe, who was a teacher, abolitionist, and educator at the newly founded Massachusetts Institute for the Blind, heard about Laura Bridgman and brought her to the school um, with the intention to help her and educate her um, in, able, uh, in abilities of communication and also functioning in the society at the time. So although students who were blind had some methods of reading in Britain and America, and schools for blind children were developing new educational techniques in France, um, so Louis Braille at this time was in Paris and he was creating a lot of new techniques, um, but Bridgman became the first European or American deaf and blind student to learn reading and writing. Charles Dickens visited Bridgman at her school during January of 1842, and the British celebrity novelist devoted a large portion of his chapter about Boston to writing about Laura Bridgman's accomplishments. However, Laura Bridgman's popularity, as well as her cultural importance, neither begins nor ends with Charles Dickens. As Kevin Hardigan, director of volunteers at Bridgman's alma mater, which still operates today as a cutting edge educational facility for students with multiple disabilities, remarked while giving a tour of the school's archive, Bridgman's first teacher, Dr. Howe, was, quote, neither shy nor humble. Howe was <laughs> friends with famous figures throughout his life, ranging from Lord Byron to Florence Nightingale, and from Samuel Morse to Abraham Lincoln. And he wrote about his most accomplished student constantly. Howe published regular progress reports about Bridgman's learning for his influential board of trustees at the school, and these reports were frequently reproduced and sometimes simply copied verbatim in numerous newspapers and magazines. In an unpublished manuscript, Maud Howe Elliott, a Pulitzer Prize winning biographer and also a daughter of Dr. Howe's, wrote that her father's reports about Laura Bridgman were, quote, awaited as eagerly as though they had been novels or like installments of novels, and they did contain new truths stranger than fiction and were translated into foreign languages. So I love this Dickens connection that Bridgman herself was like a serial installment of the novel. It was through this mass audienceship that not only Dickens, but also other writers and scientists, as well as everyday readers, such as subscribers to the New York-based Mother's Magazine, which there were some copies of in the archive, uh, learned about and came to admire Laura Bridgman. So this talk will examine two of Bridgman's most groundbreaking skills in order to demonstrate that in addition to being an important figure in the history of disability, Bridgman's widely publicized abilities place her at the nexus of a mid 19th century epistemological shift more broadly. Her education proved to both literary and scientifically oriented thinkers that language and speaking are not dependent on hearing and writing and reading are not dependent on sight. I will begin by discussing Bridgman's ability to speak and listen without hearing through her use of the finger alphabet and her rigorously discussed tendency to create her own unique, meaningful vocal expressions. Second, I will discuss Bridgman's ability to read and write without either seeing or hearing through her fluency in Boston line print and her daily journals written with square hand stencils. 
By showcasing the prevalence of Bridgman's narrative of ability in 19th century print culture of numerous disciplines, and also no disciplines at all for the people who were just interested in her as a person, my larger dissertation chapter argues that when discussing 19th century literature and science, reading and writing methods developed for people with disabilities should not be dismissed as tools only used by a small minority, but rather reestablished as critical methods that played a central role in some of the century's most influential epistemological innovations. So this will be part one, speech and communication. So when Howe first taught Bridgman to read, he used manual spelling, also called finger spelling, or my favorite word, dactylology, <laughs> a method wherein the teacher uses one sign for each of the 26 letters of the alphabet, and then makes those finger signs directly into a student's hand so that she can learn each letter's sign through touch. So this is um, Ann Sullivan, not my colleague, but the famous teacher, uh, with Helen Keller. Um, and that's the, the famous story that we've probably heard Helen Keller learned in the same way by having a teacher write directly with hand symbols into her hand. Um, so similar methods of finger spelling had been used by people who were either blind or deaf for centuries. But because Bridgman was deafblind, the way she learned such an alphabet was critically different from any of her known predecessors. Language acquisition specialist Harry Burke describes Bridgman's language development this way, quote, The great difficulty in the use of the manual alphabet was the very first step, how to make her understand the arbitrary analogy which we would establish between three or four or more letters and the thing of which it is the name. In other words, that the letters S-H-O-E, for example, stood for the thing itself, a shoe. Though Bridgman quickly was able to recognize that four or more letters combined represented an actual object or concept, it took how many weeks to help her understand that these whole words were actually made up of small individual parts which could be endless, endlessly reassembled. So even after becoming quick and proficient in spelling, a young Laura Bridgman reassembled letters and word pieces in ways that a sighted or hearing person might never think of. For example, when she signed to her teacher that she would rather go for a walk with a friend than by herself, she spelled out Laura go all hyphen T-W-O, all two, as an alternative to Laura go alone, A-L hyphen O-N-E, so all one and all two. Um, so once she had learned to communicate in this way, Howe wrote in his annual report that she had learned to distinguish the crooked lines in S-P-O-O-N as they differed as much from the crooked lines in K-E-Y as the spoon differed from the key in form. Um, so it's kind of a, a bulky quote there, but he's describing the way that she's feeling these individual words and their meaning as well as the component parts in this really complicated, thoughtful way. He acknowledged that she began by differentiating an entire word and the object it represented from another entire word and the object it represented before ever breaking the word down into the phonetic elements that traditionally would be understood by a child learning to spell um, the other way around if they can hear spelling out piece by piece. So ideas like this were not simply of interest to literary writers like Charles Dickens, but also brought thinkers such as Charles Lyell to visit Laura Bridgman twice during the same brief period, once in 1841 and again in 1842. Lyell described that, quote, her mind has been so advanced by the method of instruction pursued by Dr. Howe that she shows more intelligence and quickness of feeling than many girls of the same age who are in full possession of all their senses. The excellent reports of Dr. Howe on the gradual development of her mind, he continues, have been long before the public and have recently been cited by Mr. Dickens, together with some judicious observations of his own. So he is referencing Dickens's uh, observations and interest in the, the education of Laura, as well as just the general readers at large, and how much of a cultural conversation Laura Bridgman was at this time. But in addition to these general notes that a lot of readers may have made about Bridgman, Lyle also provides a considerable analysis about Laura Bridgman's language development. He writes that, quote, perhaps no one of the cases of a somewhat analogous nature has furnished so many new and valuable facts illustrating the extent to which all intellectual development is dependent on the instrumentality of the senses in discerning external objects, and at the same time, in how small a degree the relative acuteness of the organs of sense determine the moral and intellectual superiority of the individual. 
So this is actually working against a lot of the dominant narratives of the time um, that some of the organs like sense of sight are not necessarily contributing to a person's ability or intellect uh, as much as previously thought. So as a scientist who frequently employed language as an analogy for the structures of the natural world, Lyle's observations about Bridgman would critically inform his understanding of language acquisition and how language formation actually worked, thus resonating with future biologists and philosophers and linguists, which I will describe in my next section. So I'm moving on now to the speaking and vocal expressions um, portion of my talk. Uh, which is incredibly interesting and a little less studied than some of the more common accomplishments of Laura Bridgman. So Bridgman was able to communicate in lively and fast-paced conversations with other children at her school, as well as any teachers or tutors who all knew the finger alphabet and could converse with her. Yet, although her method of speaking was not based on hearing because she was deaf, she nonetheless uttered vocal sounds in a way that her teachers, as well as observers and visiting scholars, found productive and thought-provoking. To describe these sounds, I'm going to read a kind of long passage, um, but it's from someone who was actually there, from Dr. Howe, in his annual report of the year 1842, describing these sounds that Bridgman would make and kind of what their meaning was. So he wrote, quote, so strong seems the tendency to utter vocal sounds that Laura uses them for different persons of her acquaintance whom she meets, having a distinct sound for each one. When, after a short absence, she goes into the sitting room where there are a dozen blind girls, she embraces them by turns, uttering rapidly and in a high key the peculiar sound which designates each one. And so different are they that any of the blind girls can tell whom she is with. Now, if she were talking about these very girls to a third person, she would make the sign for them on her fingers without hesitation. Yet I am inclined to believe that the thought of their vocal sign occurs first, and is translated, as it were, into the finger language, because when she is alone, she sometimes utters these sounds or names of persons. She said to me in answer to a question why she uttered a certain sound rather than spelled the name, I think of Jeanette's noise many times when I think of how she gives me good things. I do not think to spell her name, so she thinks first to utter it. At another time, hearing her in the next room make a peculiar sound for Jeanette, I, Dr. Howe, hastened to her and asked her why she made it. She said, because I think how she do love me much and I love her very much. So she's just thinking of her friends and making the noise of her friends uh, in thought of them. I'd like to make a note here that similar to contemporary American Sign Language, um, fingerspelling uses a slightly different grammatical structure than uh, spoken English. So when you hear, or I mentioned Laura Bridgman saying, she do love me much, something like that, um, that would actually be the do plus infinitive to show the present kind of progressive rather than conjugating the verb in a way that we might think. So this report from Dr. Howe, which I just read, was like many of his publications, very widely disseminated, and it raised fascinating questions about the nature of both hearing and language. Bridgman says that she thinks of her friend's noise, but if she cannot hear in the way that hearing people understand, what is her conception of that noise? It is possible that, like many members of the deaf community today, Bridgman may have felt vibrations or other physical sensations and these would reinforce ideas by 19th century sound scientists at the time, like Hermann von Helmholtz and John Tyndall, who were increasingly coming to understand sound as a tangible physical force that acts on bodies and things, um, and all of the complexity that comes with that, rather than just something that you hear in a kind of dismissive or passive way. So furthermore, in a question that enthralled many 19th century philosophers who met her, if Bridgman had an incomplete understanding of how sound facilitates communication between two hearing people, what was to be made of her instinct to create, maintain, and use consistent sounds for each of her individual friends? Interestingly, one biographer suggests that Howe believed he could have taught Bridgman to speak, as some deaf students are able to do, but he simply did not have enough hours in the day. Regardless, Bridgman's unprecedented abilities and her uh, proclivity to actually speak entered into a much broader linguistic conversation happening among philologists and scientists and philosophers in the 1830s and 40s. So one element of this discussion at the time is the role that sound plays in language and thought, whether words are arbitrary signs or rather if they are somehow indicative of the concepts they represent. For example, at around the same time that Bridgman was learning to speak, read, and write, 
Wilhelm von Humboldt, a comparative philologist and elder brother to naturalist Alexander von Humboldt, whose work greatly influenced Darwin, wrote that without sound, human thinking, quote, cannot achieve clarity, nor can representation become a concept, end quote. To summarize his philological endeavor, which was called On the Diversity of Human Language Construction, scholar Michael Lasansky explains Humboldt's argument in this way, that external sounds are needed by the mind to, quote, compare, separate, and combine the objects in the external nature it experiences, end quote. Bridgman actively resisted this theory by learning whole objects from their external nature first without ever hearing sound in a way that Humboldt would recognize. Likewise, her ability is both to communicate without hearing herself and to make meaningful, mutually intelligible noises without having heard the external sounds made by others defied existing ideas of the nature of language, influencing how those understandings of language functioned metaphorically in future works and conversations. In addition, Bridgman's use of vocal sounds foreshadowed discussions that would occur later in the century after the nature of expression and emotion became a popular topic for dissent. In the 1880s, psychologist William James would write in his 1884 article, What is an Emotion? that the emotional brain process resembles the ordinary sensorial brain process. James argues that bodily changes follow directly the perception of the exciting fact that our feeling of the same changes as they occur as the emotion. So it's kind of like this, the steps in which you feel an emotion and then express it is something that was of interest to philosophers and psychologists. So in a similar vein, the political philosopher Franz Lieber theorized Laura Bridgman's vocal sounds in 1881 as something that he called sim phenomena, that is, phenomena created by an idea or emotion that affects the brain and the nervous system and causes an involuntary reaction as a symptom, so it's like symptom and phenomena. He wrote that, quote, the brain signals the received perceptions and evolved ideas alike to all departments and organs, and those that have the power of utterance or the power of any other manifestation exteriorize it accordingly. This is sympathy, and sim phenomena are its manifestations, end quote. Many people who met Laura Bridgman were interested in her involuntary expressions like this, particularly her facial and body language, because, quote, she has not perceived these phenomena in others. She has not learned them by unconscious imitation, nor does she know that they can be perceived by the bystander. It's just something that she does without really knowing what it looks like. So her teachers described the way that she rounded her mouth when astonished, extended her arms and fingers upwards when uncertain, and bit her lip try when trying not to laugh, precisely as persons among us would do, the teachers wrote. Um, I have a footnote here that they're very uh, forgiving of Laura Bridgman as opposed to people from other cultures who they just claim are incapable of having the same feelings as the kind of white <laughs> European people. Um, so I want to footnote that in uh, and see that I think there's something as her kind of white female subject position that's allowing them to recognize and be excited about this mimicry and saying it's so wonderful that she does it so well because she's one of us. Um, and I think in my larger chapter, I will be sure to be responsible about the way I discuss that. Um, but Laura Bridgman's actions, which were observed almost 50 years before the publication of the expression of emotions in man and animals, presage those same questions, again, not only about human nature, but about comparing various human experiences um, that would be considered by psychologists and biologists um, and human behavioral study uh, and they were discussing this with Laura Bridgman long before those discussions occurred in other places. So moving on to Boston line print, uh, I want to think now about the way that Laura Bridgman was able to write and record her own life. So we know the way she was able to speak, the way she was able to communicate with others, um, kind of non-verbally but through the, the finger signs and expressions. Uh, this is the way uh, that she became really well known through Charles Dickens. So, one of Bridgman's teachers, Mary Swift, wrote on January 29, 1842, that today Laura had the honor of a call from Charles Dickens. His great interest in her caused him to remain for several hours. She was animated in conversation, and I think he received a very correct impression of her. His notes on America contain several pages of the description of his visit. Another of Laura Bridgman's teachers, Eliza Rogers, adds that at 10 we had no regular school. Most of the girls were preparing to receive Mr. Dickens, who was expected. I repaired to the girls' schoolroom to entertain Mr. Dickens, but he did not deign to notice anything or anybody except for Laura. 
So in Dickens' travelogue, he details Bridgman's eagerness to learn, especially through reading. He writes that in her intellectual character, it is pleasing to observe an insatiable thirst for knowledge and a quick perception of the relations of things. Um, and that idea of the relations of things is particularly interesting when we think about how she learned from these big concepts abstractly into the smaller and, and you know, more phonetic or uh, sm like small scale representations. So Dickens continued by writing that in her moral character, it is beautiful to behold her continual gladness, her keen enjoyment of existence, her expansive love, and her unhesitating confidence. So he likes her a lot. Uh, one of the ways Bridgman pursued her thirst for knowledge, which Dickens uh, was so enthralled by, was by reading some of the earliest raised letter books in America. These were produced at the Massachusetts Institute's own original uh, press through a method that they created, which was called Boston Line Print. And that's a special format of somewhat triangular raised letters, which were intended to be easy to read. Um, I don't know if, if you can really see this, but like can't really zoom in, but they're, they're really hard to read. They're supposed to be easy, but they're really blocky and kind of geometric. Uh, and they're lowercase, which to me doesn't make sense, but I don't know. I wasn't a 19th century printer. Uh, so although Braille was simultaneously uh, being practiced in France, and many students and teachers in Massachusetts were likely aware of its existence in passing, Howe initially rejected the all-dot method of writing in favor of his own technique because he sought to treat the blind in a way that resembled the teaching of the sighted as closely as possible. So Braille, how worried, quote, divided the blind world from the sighted world. So that's why he chose not to embrace it. Thus, the institution meticulously crafted metal plates to print large custom textbooks on topics ranging from history and geography to arithmetic and grammar with the idea that they would be legible to sighted people as well as to students who were blind. A list sketched in the back of a teacher's notebook in the archive records that in 1842, the year of Dickens' visit, the school generally only had two copies of each book, there's hundreds of pupils there, um, likely because they were both expensive and unwieldy. So if you look, there's not really a good scale of this, but this is a book in the Boston line print, and it's like bigger than my whole arm. It's really huge, <laughs> and there's three volumes of it that you would have to keep reading. Um, so, uh, likely because they were so expensive and un unwieldy, uh, Dickens was emotionally moved by seeing the blind children read, so much that he paid for a copy of his old curiosity shop, which is actually this one on the left, to be printed in Boston line print at the school. Um, so that's what that is right there, and even if you know that it's Dickens, and even if you are totally sighted, it is really difficult to actually read. And the uh, archivists there have their students who can read contemporary Braille also struggle with it as well. Uh, people who are used to reading raised letter doesn't, doesn't really help. It was a very difficult method. Um, but at the time, that was what they used, and the students learned to read with it, and Laura Bridgman was an aficionado of this technique. So when we think about what this idea of Dickens might have to do with literature and science and the larger 19th century uh, concepts that I'm discussing, I want to bring uh, some particular thinkers into mind, which include Gillian Beer when she wrote Darwin's Plots, um, that's from the 80s, and also Devin Griffiths in 2016 who wrote The Age of Analogy. Um, both of those scholars kind of on various ends of the history of studying literature and science have analyzed the productive interplay between uh, particularly people like Charles Darwin and Charles Dickens, some of the big thinkers and the way that they create narratives and construct these ideas from observation and kind of tying lots of threads together in a meaningful way. Um, so you'll see that in a lot of this scholarship, there are direct references of the interplay between Darwin and Dickens, including uh, the Pickwick Papers, which uh, Darwin references several times in his letters he seemed to like reading very much. Um, and Darwin also quotes Oliver Twist in The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals um, and writes in his various reading journals about the Dickens that he's reading. Um, furthermore, Charles Darwin's reading journal records that in 1843, shortly after it was published, he read American Notes uh, stating that it was both poorish and goodish. That's his <laughs> review of American Notes. It's a very accurate review, like that's pretty much what the book is. Um, so 
this was kind of Darwin directly being aware of, again, this method of writing um, and this particular person and the questions that her education was raising uh, among many intellectual communities at this time. Uh, and also, you can see kind of more indirect valences of how someone like Lyle, who then influences Darwin, kind of gets built into the heritage of the connection between Laura Bridgman and other scientific thinkers and intellectuals at this time. So Charles Lyle's visit to Laura Bridgman, as well as other interests in her reading abilities from other scholars. I have a whole section on phrenologists and how interested they were in Laura Bridgman. I don't have time for that. Uh, but I can tell you in the Q&A, it's very cool. Um, when thinking about tactility and thinking about these questions of language, a lot of people are interested in the intellectual and theoretical importance of the senses and how that can inform our understanding of the development of human language. So all of those ideas made their way into the work of Darwin, who is one of the people I talk about the most, um, but also many other important figures. So one of the ways that we can see this idea of language in something like uh, Darwin's Origin of Species is through Lyle when he writes that the ancient history of the globe was, to the ancient philosophers, a sealed book. And although written in characters of the most striking and imposing kind, they were unconscious even of its existence. Um, so Darwin invoked this metaphor from Lyle, and although this analogy in kind of Victorian literature and science discourse is often read purely in terms of reading the standard English language novel, especially the Victorian multiplot novel like George Eliot or Charles Dickens, um, I want to suggest that an awareness of other forms of reading and what it might mean um, to look at those characters of the most striking and imposing kind um, is actually quite relevant for fully understanding what Darwin's meaning of that metaphor might be. So his knowledge of alternative writing and printing forms, including Boston line print, which I have up here, and then other elements of my dissertation like phonetic shorthand, um, which I discuss in another chapter and which was practiced by Darwin's grandfather, help us really understand this analogy and even the concept of how the analogies are functioning in a lot of literary as well as scientific work. So uh, following out Lyle's metaphor, Darwin writes, I look at the natural geological record as a history of the world imperfectly kept and written in a changing dialect. Of this history, we possess the last volume alone, relating only to two or three countries. Of this volume, only here and there a short chapter has been preserved, and of each page, only here and there a few lines. Each word of the slowly changing language in which history is supposed to be written being more or less different in the interrupted succession of chapters, may represent the apparently abruptly changed forms of life entombed in our consecutive but widely separated formations. Um, so I want to pick up a few key moments of this passage from Darwin when he discusses a few lines here and there of our remaining history. And the etymological metaphor is really about language evolution and change, right? It's like Proto-Indo-European and English and all of those things. Um, but if we look at Laura Bridgman and Boston line print, what we can see is that the, the naturalist in this metaphor, as the reader of nature, is physically picking up whatever pieces they can from their investigation out in the natural world. So like Laura Bridgman, they're mentally reconstructing the pieces by first imagining the whole object or what the abstract concept they represent really is. And then from there, kind of dissecting the various parts and trying to understand how the world works. So we can play with this analogy and with this metaphor and with the order of kind of epistemological understanding to really think about this much further reaching book of nature metaphor, which goes to the romantics and even before, um, and how that might be shifting and changing in the 19th century moment that I'm describing here. So my last section here is the square handwriting, which I mentioned a bit earlier. Uh, so, as I've said, Bridgman was not only an avid reader, but a skilled writer, um, which is incredibly impressive considering um, her being both deaf and blind. Um, Howe himself wrote that the most gratifying acquirement which Bridgman has made, and the one which has given her the most delight, in the pow is the power of writing a legible hand and expressing her thoughts upon paper. She writes with a pencil in a grooved line, so it's kind of like a stencil, um, and makes her letters clear and distinct, 
She was sadly puzzled at first to know the meaning of the process to which she was subjected, but when the idea dawned upon her mind that by means of it she could convey intelligence to her mother, her delight was unbounded. So you have a blind student who's like, what am I doing? Why do I have to have all these stencils and like I can't see what, I, what, what this is for? Um, but learning the meaning of that communication and also communicating with her mother who is not trained as a you know, teacher for a person who's blind um, was very important to Laura Bridgman. So that was one method that Laura Bridgman used, and we can see examples of it here. It gets easier after you stare at it for a really long time, <laughs> uh, but it is rather square, um, and it is, again, lowercase. And there's kind of so like capital I for the you know pronoun is always just lowercase. Her name is always just lowercase. It's always just the same kind of stencil square templates for writing. Um, and she also had another way to quote unquote write if she just wanted to leave a temporary message. So something we might think of as like you know a whiteboard or whatever. Uh, what she also had was block like letters that she could lay out to spell a message to somebody. So Dickens explains this in American Notes and says that she used, quote, a set of metal types with the different letters of the alphabet cast upon their ends, as well as a board in which were square holes into which holes she could set the types um, so that the letters on their ends could alone be felt above the surface. So she's like sticking, um, you know, little letters to fill out a line to temporarily produce a message for someone she's discussing uh, something with. Uh, Dickens writes that on any article being handed to Bridgman, for instance, a pencil or a watch, she would select the component letters and arrange them on her board and read them with apparent pleasure. So this is another way of communication as well as writing and communicating um, with someone maybe who was not trained to speak to her in kind of her more native language. Um, so these abilities lead to one of the most important elements of my project, um, because we've been discussing all of the things said about Laura Bridgman, but the fact here is that Laura Bridgman was not only a chapter in many other people's stories, but she also told her own story every single day. Um, it's oftentimes very mundane or funny because she was 12, um, <laughs> but how, as well as Bridgman's teachers, Swift and Rogers, taught her to write in a daily journal. So using square hand stencil writing and a metal guide, she carefully wrote out each letter and line um, and knew exactly where to go to fit words where they were supposed to be. Uh, Bridgman's journal entries mainly describe activities of her everyday life, like things she learned in school, what she ate for her meals, who came to visit, and what other classmates she played with. She signed each journal entry at the bottom, just like this, with her name. So it's always very, very neat um, and kind of predictable in the way that she would format discussing her day. Entertainingly, in her journal, Bridgman did not seem to be nearly as excited about Charles Dickens as he was about her. Her journal for the date of Dickens' visit barely even mentions him. It simply reads, quote, Rogers taught me and the other girls to write in journals. I ate some bread and butter. Ladies and gentlemen came to see girls. That's it. <laughs> so I went to Boston for, for that. Um, but it was amazing because there's a lot to be analyzed in how little Laura Bridgman cares about Dickens. Um, first of all, it's possible that because the Massachusetts Institute didn't have a copy of Dickens's work in a, a, a form that was legible to her, she hadn't read Dickens before, she didn't really understand these long, amazing novels that everyone talked about. Um, she did later have access to that after he had visited, but at the time, it wouldn't have been something that was very familiar to her. Um, however, Bridgman's teacher, Mary Swift, provides another possibility, which is slightly troubling from a 21st century standpoint, and which I'm kind of trying to figure out what the most troubling element of this is. Um, but in her journal entry for the day of Dickens' visit, Swift includes the following explanation. When taken to the schoolroom for exhibition, Bridgman was told that the blind girls were sitting in their desks all around the room, and that ladies and gentlemen came to see how the blind girls could be taught. Uh, so many celebrities would come to visit Laura Bridgman because she was the most famous of the pupils, but uh, her teacher writes, quote, she never had an idea that her share of the attention was greater than theirs. <laughs> But if the hundredth part of the comments which were intended to reach her had been repeated, all our efforts to preserve her a modest, simple-hearted child would have been to no avail. 
so that, yeah, that feels very 19th century in terms of how they want to treat this moral, you know, impressionable child in a way that doesn't give her too much fame. Um, and so from Laura Bridgman's perspective, it wasn't really about her fame and celebrity as one unique reader among the many other students with disabilities at her school. Um, for, for her, it was more about the social experience of learning to communicate with other people and just being a part of a community. So there were a lot of things going on about Laura Bridgman, which I have very little evidence that she knows much about. Um, this includes the fact that little girls in England and America were tying ribbons around their doll's eyes uh, to make them look like Laura Bridgman because, uh, you know, Cree sunglasses, she would wear these green ribbons around her eyes for the sighted people who might, you know, not really be familiar with seeing people who are blind. So. In addition to little girls looking up to Laura Bridgman and wanting their dolls to be like her, one of the best-selling souvenirs from a visit to the Massachusetts Institute, which, uh, again, there's a long, complicated history of, uh, you know, kind of spectatorship of places like schools for disabilities or mental asylums and things like that in the 19th century where people would just come in and take a look. Um, and the Massachusetts Institute would sell things, including a needle that had been threaded by Laura Bridgman, which was a bestseller. Um, Laura Bridgman was capable of threading a needle really quickly using only her hands and mouth. Uh, and this was like a party trick that people were incredibly interested in and would come to purchase. Um, in a good sense, it provided funding for the school and for many blind students who needed an education. Um, but in another sense, there's this kind of spectatorship and a, a bit of a problem with the way that her celebrity is being treated. And by this point, you can see she's a much older woman in this picture. Um, again, it's, it's not quite the little girl they're trying to protect anymore, but a kind of more complicated history of a woman making a living and being a kind of public figure. So. As I mentioned to Bridgman, it was really a social importance of being a member of the Massachusetts Institute. She actually graduated in her late teens and moved back home with her mother very briefly, but pretty much as soon as she returned to a very quiet country house without people who were capable of speaking her language, she developed what we might think of as a major depression and, and didn't have anyone or anything to care about or communicate about. So hearing about this, her former teacher, Dr. Howe, invited her back to the school uh, where she served as a seamstress and a sewing teacher and lived for the rest of her life until she was 60, um, helping other students and continuing to be a part of the community that she had once been so influential in and then continued to contribute to. So this brings me to the conclusion of my talk, uh, which brings up a more famous figure that we all know, which is Helen Keller. Um, so, when Laura Bridgman was an old woman, there was a new student to the Massachusetts Institute, now renamed the Perkins School, um, and she came, she was also deaf and blind, she was a young kind of wild child, uh, and she was going to be educated in the same way that Laura Bridgman was. And the people at the school called her the new Laura, which Laura Bridgman didn't like. Um, she, didn't, she was an old woman and there was this eight-year-old girl who was running around and they're like, it's you. She's like, it's not me. Uh, so Helen Keller and Laura Bridgman met one time and the meeting was not a positive one. Um, and when I asked the archivist about kind of any history of this or the relationship between one woman who with Laura Bridgman, she was once famous, but now we don't really know her. With Helen Keller, she became famous and continued to be famous, and you learn about her in school as an elementary student. She's so well known. Um, and what the archivist told me is, well, there aren't that many famous seamstresses, um, which is a really kind of sad reflection on not recognizing the role that Laura Bridgman played because Helen Keller was a social activist and she was uh, you know, anti-war and she was doing civil rights and the NAACP and she wrote a letter to Hitler. If you don't know all of that amazing history, I think that's why Helen Keller is a figure who continues to be learned about, whereas Laura Bridgman was once this kind of novelty and then went back to her school and, and sat and taught sewing and was a little bit forgotten about. Um, but what I've tried to show in this uh, chapter and what I'm continuing to work out as I work on my dissertation is that it's not just Laura Bridgman's immediate historical moment and kind of brief celebrity as this person with these skills 
Um, and, and that's important to the history of people who are blind and people with disabilities. But there's also all these important questions about how people learn, how people think, um, and all of the ideas of sensory experience and how that informs our knowledge of the world. So with Laura Bridgman, her story allows us to think about all of those questions in a variety of different fields, even today, you know, way after she's been passed away in a way that an immediate political or historical figure uh, might not resonate in the same way. So both of these uh, influential women are super important and uh, you know critical in many ways, but I want to continue emphasizing Laura Bridgman and all the different kind of fields of thinking and scholarship uh, that her work and her experiences are able to contribute to. So thank you all very much.